So, Father in heaven, it indeed has been a beautiful and wonderful Sabbath day. Just a foretaste of getting together with your fellow believers and encouraging each other, raising our voices in prayers, in hymns, hearing inspired messages, and even talking about our history. You indeed have blessed, and you have indeed been faithful. Tonight, as we enter the uh, close of the Sabbath, and as we um, go into our final presentation tonight on a very serious topic, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will once again be here with each of us. Uh, Speak through me your words, but may your Holy Spirit open up each and every heart to hear what you'd have them to hear. Be with those that are listening online. We pray for our church. We pray for our church leaders, former North American Division president who passed away, Elder Jackson. We pray that you'd be with his family in a special way. And as we see the winds of strife increasing in our world, we just pray that we, your people, can finally um, be prepared to give that trumpet the, the note that needs to go to the world. Prepare us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a very quick few days, starting here Wednesday evening. Um, just was encouraged by um, the messages that my brothers and sisters that presented up here presented. I believe that they were um, really in harmony with each other. They continued to build on each other. And the more that we study this message, the more I see that each and every presentation is integrated so that they're not chopped up in these little uh, talking about one topic because every topic is really talking about Jesus. And uh, every topic enhances our understanding of what he has done, the faith that he's shown toward us. And uh, it just kind of builds. One of the problems with being the last speaker is you hear all your good quotes and all your favorite texts go by, not once, not twice, sometimes three or four times. On the other hand, you can find some good quotes and just work them in too, so there could be some benefits. Um, Tonight we're going to talk about the beauty of repentance. And I'm going to put up a quote that Bob referred to from a general conference session that Ellen White was commenting on in 1901. It's a rather long quote. It's actually two pages. But uh, the real thing I want us to contemplate is what might have been. And Bob put it in reference to what might have been at the general conference. Um, I want us to apply this even to our lives today. But Ellen White states, and this was again written in 1903, but she states that she's reflecting back at the previous general conference session. And at that meeting, I carried a very heavy burden, and I have carried it ever since. We did not gain the victory that we might have gained at that meeting. Why? Because there were so few who followed the course of Josiah. There were, what was the course of Josiah? Repentance. Because there were so few who followed the course of Josiah, there were those at that meeting who did not see the work that needed to be done. If they had confessed their sins, if they had made a break, if they had taken their stand on vantage ground, the power of God would have gone through the meeting and we should have had a Pentecostal season. Do you think that we were meant to be Pentecostal? You didn't think so, but there is a place and a time for a season of repentance. The Lord has shown me what might have been had the work been done that ought to have been done. In the night season, I was present in a meeting where brother was confessing to brother. Those present fell upon one another's necks and made heartbroken confessions. The spirit and power of God were revealed No one seemed too proud to bow before God in humility and contrition. 
Those who led in this work were the ones who had not before had courage to confess their sins. She saw this in the night season. This might have been all this the Lord was willing to do for his people. All heaven was waiting to be gracious. God is in earnest with us. If the heart is pure, there will be purity of action and nobility of purpose in all the work that is done. Every mind is to be cleansed, every heart purified. All are to understand that sin is not to be tolerated by the people who have received the most precious light ever given to mortals. And just to pause there, we've been focusing all week long, or all, all the last three days, on how gracious God is and how merciful God is. And this says we're to understand that, not, that sin is not to be tolerated by the people who have received the most precious light ever given to mortals. Does that seem like it's in contrast with what we've been studying? Only a little while, and he who shall come will come and will not tarry. Those who choose to cleave to their sins must perish. But God will have compassion on all who will make thorough work for eternity. And again, that's the General Conference Bulletin, April 1, 1903, but reflecting back on the 1901 General Conference. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about repentance, and we're going to be talking about sin. So, heaven's message to us is, and always has been, repent. What did Noah preach? A message of repentance. It's uh, curious to understand that in the very first sermon that Jesus was publicly recorded as preaching, what did he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is next to you. What was the very first sermon that John preached? John was a preacher of repentance, a pe preacher of righteousness who called people to repent. And so, why was God giving his message of repentance to the church at that day? Why was Jesus preaching to the Jews and John the Baptist preaching to the Jews a message of repentance? So the message always goes to the church first because the church influences the world. And as the church goes, the world will go. And so God works through his church to reach the world. And so for some of us, sin has been with us for a very long time. We've tolerated it. We've had the consequences of it. And it has been ingrained into our life for a long time. We can experience forgiveness of sin instantaneously with repentance. But a change of character may take a longer time. Think about Moses. Moses was someone God wanted to use, but did he have a character defect? He slew the Egyptian. He didn't use God's method. And yet... I'm sure that he experienced repentance, but it took 40 years for God to change his character flaw so that it could be said of Moses that never was there someone, <laughs> I always think it's curious that it's in the book he wrote, but somebody must have wrote the last page of it, but never was there a prophet as humble as Moses, <laughs> written by Moses. but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Kelly. So, character is important. And God is looking for a people who reflect his character. This is not an instantaneous process. It's not a repent once and be done with it. And uh, it's not, oh yeah, I repented when I was converted, and that's the last of it. So tonight we're going to be talking a little bit more about what repentance is and what it does. And so I want to go back to a story that we're all familiar with. 
And we're not going to read the story itself. You guys all know it. We're going to look at the response to the story. You know, as I was preparing this talk, I was struck by the fact that I excuse sin. I don't see sin as toxic as God sees sin. It's easy to just say, oh yes, Lord, please forgive me and be done with it. Simple prayer. And so let's look at sin as through David's experience. How bad is sin? Well, David, in his prayer of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba, prays a prayer that we're all familiar with. Not going to read the whole thing, but verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. That's the part we like to emphasize. God is a merciful God. God is loving and God is quick to forgive us. And so it seems easy to just reflect on, oh yeah, God, I just asked you to forgive me and just please be merciful to me. It almost implies that, oh yeah, I did that sin, but just please uh, pretend it never happened. Just wipe away the consequences. Be merciful to me according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. Is this a heartfelt prayer of repentance? Indeed. David is recognizing what he has done. He is pleading for to the relationship with God to be restored. And he's asking to be cleansed. And he's asking to have the transgression removed. He's not just confessing. He's repenting. In verse 4, it say, states that against you, you only have I sinned. And that is absolutely true. The greatest thing that we do when we sin is bring dishonor to God. We make a heyday for the devil to accuse God. That God's people can't even... I mean, this was a horrendous thing. God's people, his chosen leader... Um, the leader of his chosen people would murder and commit adultery and lie and try to cover it up. And so, you know, most of the sins that we encounter day by day, uh, most of them are relational. We harm someone else because of our carelessness. What we don't realize is that if sin is not immediately confessed and repented of, it continues to do a work in our lives. And so we don't even want to understand what God calls sin, but God hates sin because it does a work of destroying us. It will start to eliminate your ministry at church. It will start to separate you from your family members. It will separate you from your spouse. It will separate you from your children. It starts immediately to destroy relationships. And so in Psalms 51, from David's perspective, we see that he is begging for mercy. He's looking for cleansing. He's looking to be forgiven. Over in verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And restore to me the joy of your salvation. Do you think in those weeks or months that were going on before this happened, probably close to nine months before he was confronted that David experienced joy? Sin eats at your heart. It destroys all hope and all joy. And it says, uphold to me, uphold me with your generous spirit. Did God have an obligation to forgive David? No. That's why it's called mercy. And so David is absolutely right to realize that he has sinned primarily against God. We like to think, well, with knowing the grace and the mercy of God, 
in the love of God that we can just quickly con confess our sins and be done with it. But there is a deeper work that needs to happen. Let's flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and let's look at the same sin from God's perspective. 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan the prophet comes to David and of course he tells him a parable. And uh, David gets angry in verse 5 and says that man should die and that he should restore the lamb fourfold. And then Nathan the prophet says, but David, you are the man. And it says, I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel in Judah. And if that were, had been too little, I also would have given you much more. God had exalted David with every good thing that he could possibly give him. And he's really saying here, there is no excuse for this. David didn't just fall into sin. David chose to sin. It wasn't just an accident. It's something that he thought about, contemplated, and acted on. Verse 9 says, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed her, Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to, your, to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Amnon, Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversaries against you in, from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your, to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. He says, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. Do you think that for one moment David's sin was secret? Joab's a pretty smart guy. He knew what David was up to. There's people in the town of Jerusalem. It's a pretty small spot. It's all Bathsheba going over to the, over to the, uh, well, he sent his servants over to get her, so some of them knew. She's now nine months pregnant, just about when this Nathan comes in. It wasn't a secret. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Did David deserve to die? The wages of sin is death. So is the wages for adultery and murder. David did indeed deserve to die. But does that mean that David was free of the consequences? He never escaped the consequences. The consequences perhaps have continued to even this day. It's an interesting text in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 32. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 32, I think has big implications for our day. In the chapter about the blessings of obedience, there are also curses for disobedience. One of those curses is in verse 32, your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day and they shall be no, there shall be no strength in your hand. I believe that's what's happening to our youth in our church today. We retain less than 30% of our young people. They've been given to another people. They've been given over to the world. It's a result of our sin. Sin is lethal. Sin destroys. It affects our children. And so the very first consequence of David's sin is the very baby that was conceived by his sin died just a few days after being born. 
Did David lose any other sons? It might not be directly related to this, but when you have failed morally in relationships, you can't take a strong stand with your congregation. You can't take a, st- a strong stand with your children. And so perhaps Amnon, realizing his father was weak, uh, took, his, took uh, Absalom's sister. Absalom then killed Amnon, so that was one of David's sons. And then, of course, David didn't deal well with Absalom. David couldn't confront sin, and he lost Absalom. Now, maybe Amnon will be in heaven. I don't know. We don't know if he confessed. But Absalom was hung on a tree, hung by his hair in a, in a tree, which was a sign of the curse of God. It's one thing to lose your child from an early death. It's another thing to lose your child knowing that there is absolutely no hope of salvation, no hope of a resurrection to life. And that's a great thing that David had to live with for the rest of his life. So David sinned in the presence of, in the backdrop of God's overwhelming love to him. God had given him every blessing. And that means that he despised God's law. He despised God's love. And he rejected that. And yet God is merciful to him. David went on to write in Psalms 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. David was actually asking God to judge him. David understood that the only peace, the only joy that can ever come is a joy that's found with God revealing our sins and cleansing us from them. And so David is pleading to be judged. And so it should be with a fear of trembling that we say, oh God, search me and test me and see if there's anything in me. The very name of Jesus should cause us to think about, is there anything that separates us from him? And so it should be that every day as we begin our day, as we name the name of Jesus, that we should say, search me. Repentance is an experience that we need to live every day. It's part of a daily relationship with God. Ellen White, First Selected Messages, page 204, states that the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation is to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Were this reformation to take place, what would be the results? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Have we seen any of this happen in our church? Have we done any of this? Let me read a quote from Testimonies to, uh, no, actually in Education, page 190, that Bob read. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the word as a whole and to see the relation in, of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy, and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy, to the great consummation. 
He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience, how in every act of life he himself lost my place, but he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives, and how whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. We talk about these two opposing principles. What are they? What are the two opposing principles that have been in place throughout the great controversy? Yeah, or is it going to be self sacrificing love? Or is it going to be self exaltation? Is that present in our world today? Well, looking back at this quote, is that present in our church today? Anybody dare say yes? Anybody dare say silence? You know, it's really easy to talk about repentance when we're talking about the world. It's easy to talk about repentance when we're talking about the church. It's easy to talk about repentance when I'm talking about all of you guys. It's not very easy talking about repentance when we're talking about ourselves. Are those two opposing principles present in each, in lo- each of our lives? And so, yes, it's no wonder that we see things happening in our church that Ellen White predicted would happen because these very same things are happening in our lives. And we are deciding which side of the great controversy we're going to stand on. So we have seen, have we seen reforms that attack the doctrines of our church? What's been attacked? Spirit of prophecy? The sanctuary? The nature of Christ? The gospel? Health reform? The Godhead? The Trinity, creation, is there anything that hasn't been attacked? The devil hates every one of God's principles. I used to think that the devil in Revelation was opposing the first four commandments because he hates those. They talk about the truth about God and our relationship to him. But you know what? He hates the other six just as much. He is attacking marriage. He is attacking the Sabbath. He is attacking the doctrine of the Trinity. He is attacking the nature of Christ. I was uh, just struck with the fact that I was doing some Bible studies at work with two, uh, with a Catholic and a Protestant friend that I work with, and they were reading parts of the great controversy, and they were like, you know what? The Catholic guy was saying, you know what? In my church, they don't talk about Jesus. They talk about Mary, and they talk about the saints, and they talk about everybody but Jesus. It was like an an epiphany to him. And um, it's like, yeah, that's right. The devil has done everything he can to obscure the gospel. If he can separate Christ from us, so he's not tempted in all points like as we are, that weakens the gospel. And he hates the Sabbath. He hates anything that points back to creation, marriage, the Sabbath. All these things are under attack. And sadly, these things are under attack even in our own church. You know what? When I was just... Coming back into the church, I grew up an Adventist, a fourth-generation Adventist, but I left for about a year and a half or two. Mentally, I'd probably left a year or two before that. I was coming back into church. um, Twice the legalist I was when I left, determined that I just had to try even harder to do what was right. I don't see Don, but Don and I would go around looking for truth and various things. Um, We went... I got invited to go hear David Koresh. Only reason I didn't go is because David Koresh had a rock band and that kept me away. (laughs) 
<laughs> Praise God. I had a little bit of discernment. <laughs> we would go off and hear anybody that we could hear. We went to meetings down in Los Angeles with a group called the Lord Our Righteousness Movement where the leader weighed about 380 pounds and said, I haven't sinned in five years. <laughs> and if you look back at his wife, she just kind of she just kind of gritted her teeth every time he said it. We knew that wasn't the truth. Got off studying reinterpretations of prophecy. Just looking for anything that would inspire and stimulate and be something new. And so I can't blame our young people. I can't even blame our typical pastors for the fact that we are wandering around looking for everything because we don't know the gospel. That's why we've been meeting here the last four days. There is a dearth of the gospel in our preaching around the world. There's little pockets of it that you can hear, but when it's preached in all its fullness, there will be a revival. And so those that are looking for reinterpretation of prophecy, this is the gospel is the answer, the messages that we've been hearing. If you're wondering about the Trinity, if you're questioning creation, I didn't become a creationist because I started studying the science. I became a creationist because I read lessons on faith and I became convicted that that's the way God works. He calls nothing into existence and it's just like that. Amen. And so I can't blame our people. They have been without a shepherd because there has been a resistance of this message, but we have been reaping the consequences for nearly four generations. And as a result, every wind of doctrine is blowing. And so, we have a problem. We have a problem. About 20 years ago, the pollster George Gallup polled Americans who profess to be Christians. And in his poll, he found out that of those Americans who professed to be Christians, there was virtually no difference in the way they lived their everyday life from Americans who did not profess to be Christians. They went to the same entertainment. They spent their money on the same things. They all still drank alcohol in similar amounts. The divorce rate was similar. Um, they had similar views of morality they had similar views of sexual experiences outside of marriage. The statistics were virtually the same. Fortunately, George Gallup didn't pull the Seventh-day Adventist church. But we are not too far behind our culture. Ellen White stated, Today, a large part of those who compose our congregation are dead in trespasses and sins. They come and go like the door upon its hinges. For years they have complacently listened to the most solemn, soul-stirring truths, but they have not put them in practice. Therefore, they are less and less sensible of the preciousness of the truth. The stirring testimonies of reproof and warning do not arouse them to repentance. The sweetest melodies that come from God through human lips, justification by faith, the righteousness of Christ do not call forth from them a response of love and gratitude. Though the heavenly merchant man displays before them the richest jewels of faith and love, though he invites them to buy of him gold tried in the fire and white raiment that they may be clothed and eye salve that they may see, they steal their hearts against him and fail to exchange their lukewarmness for love in zeal. While making a profession, they deny the power of godliness. If they continue in this state, God will reject them. They are unfitting themselves to be members of his family. 
And so we find today that our church is not that much different than other churches. We're losing our unique message and our distinct mission. We've moved more to just grace-oriented but non-doctrinal religion based on convenience. We've had the emerging church movement sweep across Adventism in Western countries, and it's changed our services to an experience-based service. We're not very focused on evangelism, and we are headed toward irrelevance. How do we get here? How do we wind up losing our youth? Why are we reaping the consequences of our forefathers? We sing the faith of our fathers, but you know what? There's also the unbelief of our fathers. And that has been working in our church since the 1880s. And we are destined to repeat their history unless we recognize it and turn from it and repent. That's why knowing our history is crucial. We are five generations now since 1844. We can't keep preaching that Jesus is coming back very soon for over 200 years and have it mean anything. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. Jesus is preaching to his disciples and he's telling them things that are starting to get scary. John chapter 6, verse 51, And I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Verse 53 says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. And down in verse 57, he says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he, feeds, he who feeds on me will live because of me. And Jesus began to start teaching the principle of the cross, the principle of self-denial. And down in verse 60, my Bible says that many disciples turned away. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. What was it? that caused them to leave the preaching of the cross. Self-sacrificing love. It's not going to be popular. But if we're going to experience a revival in our church, I'm afraid we're going to see it empty out first. Jerry mentioned this afternoon in, the, in his workshop that, uh, what did he say, the majority will forsake us. That's a sad thing. But we shouldn't be discouraged. The preaching of the truth may actually empty out our church at first. But Ellen White states that for everyone that leaves, how many more will come in? Some places 10 and another place 100. And what brings this about? The preaching of the message of repentance will prepare us to be ready to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. Baptism is an outward sign, but far too many Seventh-day Adventists are like the Jews when the prophet said, circumcise your hearts. They haven't been truly converted. We haven't been truly converted. And so, there is no forgiveness of sin if we're not willing to forsake the sin and live under the lordship of Jesus as our Savior. True repentance isn't just confession, but it's a turning away. A dead work religion that goes to meetings once a year to feel good, goes to your church, signs up to teach a class once in a while. If we're doing those things so that we can feel good with God, it is a dead formalistic religion. It is legalism. 
In the Hebrews 6 verse 1 states that we must repent of our dead works. We have to repent of our religion that we thought was going to save us, not just repenting of our sins. We need to repent of our dead works. And so, if we real quickly, we're running out of time, but real quick, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy is the last book that uh, Moses wrote before Joshua took over. And as he is preparing the children of Israel, who is now in their second generation, he begins recounting their history. Deuteronomy chapter 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispose or dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, a people that are tall and the descendants of Anakim. That's what kept them out in the first place. Verse 6, he says, Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Could that be said of us as a people? Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Patty cited a quote written in 1901 that we may have to remain in this world many more years because of what? Insubordination. Refusing to believe God's messengers. We were no different than the Jews when they sent 12 spies to go out and spy out the land and two came back with a good report, Caleb and Joshua. And we as Seventh-day Adventists were standing on the very brink of the promised land in the 1880s and 90s and our brethren didn't believe the reports of two young men. Wagner and Jones. And they went with the majority report. And we are no different than the Jews who refused to enter the promised land. Except that I believe that this same message has been coming back roughly every generation. God raised up Taylor Bunch at the Battle Creek Tabernacle with the... With the uh, sermons that he gave called the Exodus and Type in Antitype, where he traced the history of Adventism in repeating the very same thing that the Jews repeated. That was a call to repentance. And A.G. Daniels wrote a book called uh, Christ Our Righteousness, which was the gospel message of Christ Our Righteousness. It was still resisted. In the 1950s and 60s, God rose up Elder Whelan, in short. And they have gone to their grave. But God is going to have a people. He hasn't given up. And I believe that we are seeing things happening. Verse 24 says, You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Flip over to Leviticus 26. Verse 40, there's hope. If they confess their iniquity in the iniquities of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also have walked contrary to me. I will remember the land. I will accept them. Verse 45, it says, But for their sake I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. Why confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers? 
Bob wrote a, read a quote that says that if we don't understand our history, we're going to repeat it. And we've been repeating it over and over and over. Did we resist the Holy Spirit in 1888? If we don't accept that as our own and confess of it, we will do the very same thing when we're confronted with the very same circumstances. Who does Ellen White state was responsible for the state of our church? The sad fact is apparent that the work in these fields ought to be years in advance of what it is now, but the negligence on the part of Jerry, the ministers, has discouraged the people. But before you point fingers at the ministers, what else does it say? And the lack of interest and self-sacrifice and the appreciation of the work on the part of? Who's included in this? Who's not included in this? <laughs> no one. We've discouraged the ministers. This loss, the loss is too great to be computed. God has been insulted. And if the mistakes that have been made are not seen and repented of, they will surely be repeated. Corporate repentance was never, ever promoted as a vote at the general conference to confess or make a proclamation about what happened a hundred years ago. Corporate repentance is accepting responsibility and recognizing that I will make the very same mistakes that they made if I don't see myself in their shoes and confess of their sins as if they were my own. Were you there when they rejected my Lord in 1888? You haven't sung that song. But we were there when they crucified my Lord and we would have done the very same thing as our church members did in the 1880s, but by the grace of God. Testimonies of Ministers 456, or 456. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God and laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. What's the process of laying self in the dust? Crucifying self. The process is actually repentance. Repentance is actually a promising word because it means there is hope. It's actually the process of restoring us back with God and restoring us with our children and our spouses and our church members. I was having a conversation with my brother at a church that he goes to where two different elders had been in a dispute. And after hearing about what happened, I was just told him, you know, some things aren't going to be resolved until Jesus comes. And then I went home and thought about it and said, you know what? That won't work if we're living in the Day of Atonement. If we want to be translated, these problems have to be worked out before Jesus comes. And repentance is the process. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There needs to be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God's not willing to bestow it, but because we have been unprepared to receive it. Down in the bold, it says, we have a part to play in this by confession, humiliation, repentance, in earnest prayer. Is there a difference between confession and repentance? If all we do is confess and we don't repent, we'll be in twice as much trouble as we were before we confessed. Confession is important. It's the recognition of my wrong, but repentance is turning away from it and asking God to cleanse me from it and deliver me from it like he did with David. In earnest prayer. You know, sin brings brief pleasure, but lasting sorrow. Pleasure for a season, but everlasting sorrow. Repentance brings brief pain. Brief sorrow, but lasting joy. 
Which would you rather have? The pleasures of sin for a season with its eternal consequences or to grieve and to mourn now for a season over your sin but knowing that you will experience everlasting joy. That is the power of repentance. There is a need today of such a revival of true heart religion as was experienced by ancient Israel. Repentance is the first step that must be taken by all who would return to God. So what can we do when we recognize that we are a part of the Laodicean church? It's easy to say that it's the minister's problem. It's easy to say it's the general conference's problem. But this is our problem. The prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, we don't have time to go over that. There's not one record in the Bible of Daniel ever personally committing a sin. And yet he identifies himself with his people. Daniel has become very concerned that the prophecy about the 70 weeks of the restoration of Jerusalem is coming up. And he doesn't see anything happening. And so he begins intercessory prayer. And as part of intercessory prayer, he says, we have sinned. Our forefathers have sinned. He confesses all of Israel's sin as if it was his own sin. And in doing so, he intercedes and he gets the angel to come and tell him what's about to happen. We need to study our history so that we won't repeat it. We need to study Israel's history so we can learn from it. And we need to encourage each other. If we are pointing fingers at people, that leads to condemnation. That causes us to put our guard up. And the last thing people are going to do is repent when they have their guard up. But if we can humbly surround each other and say, yes, I've been there, I know what you're going through. If we can do that in love, we can encourage a spirit of repentance. There is no eighth church in Revelation. And we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 3. But before we do, let's stop with, step, check over with Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and then they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is the experience of repentance. We don't like to suffer. We don't like to mourn. We don't like to grieve. But we should learn the one good thing that Job's three friends did. They sat down next to him for a week before they said a single word. When people are wrestling with the grief that comes from really truly understanding their sin, it brings a pain to our hearts. And we shouldn't be too quick to try to relieve it. This is an experience that we need to go through. When is the last time you seriously sat down or knelt and prayed and mourned for what your sin has done for Jesus to Jesus? When have you experienced tears of repentance? Signs the time, September 10, 1896. By their doubt and unbelief, God's people do much to grieve the heart of God. Let no thought of unbelief afflict your souls, for unbelief acts as paralysis upon spiritual energies. Do not magnify your difficulties, but keep the Lord in your remembrance, watching unto prayer. There is a repentance that once we've gone through it, it will actually free us from our paralysis. Micah 7 verse 9 says, And he will again have compassion on us. He will blot out our iniquities. Yea, they, thou wilt cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. There is a promise that we will be set free. Um, for the interest of time, I'm going to skip over 2 Corinthians 7. I'm not going to read it. But Paul had to rebuke 
and called the Corinthians to repentance. It doesn't say what it was for. But then Titus brought back news that they had accepted it gladly. And Paul is here stating that I loved you so much. Um, I hope that you took it with love that I rebuked you. And he says, I do not, I, I, I do not feel bad that I did this because it was for your good. There is a repentance that sets us free. And Paul called them to repentance. We already looked at Zechariah um, chapter 12, verse 10. Jesus stated, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Part of repentance is learning to mourn and to grieve over our sin. The nearer we come to Jesus and the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly shall we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. There will be a continual reaching out of the soul after God, a continual earnest heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of heart before him. At every advanced step in our Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. Before we go on, let me just give a practical picture of what true repentance is. How many of you have been wronged by someone? <laughs> Everybody. And have you experienced when they realized that they hurt you, they said, oh, yeah, if I hurt you, I'm sorry. It's kind of the usual response, right? Is that true repentance? Did it make you feel any better? <laughs> but that's kind of what we do with God. True heartfelt repentance recognizes the harm that we have caused another. And if I can't come to you with tears in my eyes and say to my wife, Lindy, I realize that this hurt you deeply. And I've been just sensing how bad what I did was. And I can't sleep until I talk to you. Would you forgive me? Is that repentance? It's getting closer. <laughs> this isn't something that we do easily. The very hardest words for me to say is, I was wrong. <laughs> it takes crucifixion of self to admit that. We do everything we can to avoid the cross. We want a crossless confession that is not truly repentance. What would you say today, Bob? You want a repentance that passes for Yeah, a method of forgetting God that passes as remembering him. We want the same thing in our repentance. A simple way of just excusing ourselves so we feel better without actually getting to the root. But the Day of Atonement ministry is about setting us free and going to the very depths of not just our consciences, but our subconscious sins. That is a day of atonement experience. At every step, every advanced step in our Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. We shall know that our sufficiency is in Christ alone and shall make the apostles' confession our own. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. Repentance is the tool to crucify self and to allow Jesus to fill us with his righteousness. Christ Object Lessons, page 415. 
It is the darkness of the misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. And at this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed. A message that's illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory. The light of his goodness, his mercy in truth. We understand that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. When we understand that he's not condemning us, that he loves us, that he loves us more than he loves even himself, that he is desperately pursuing us, that he wants us to experience this cleansing because sin is what destroys us, then it's the work of repentance to actually set us free. And so we're going to end with Revelation chapter 3, a passage that you all know that we cover almost every time we have an 1888 conference, and it's to the lukewarm church. Now, Lindy actually asked her Sabbath school class, which church were we a part of? And 90% of the hands went up that we are Philadelphia. We don't want to be the lukewarm Laodicean church. We don't think of ourselves as the lukewarm Laodicean church. But does this fit us? I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. Yeah, we've been hanging on for 150 years. But the very fact that we're still here means that we have not experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because you say I am rich and have become enriched and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We are truly, as a church, nearly impotent before the world. We do a little bit of good. And part of Amen, we do a little bit of health clinics to help a few poor people. We preach a few evangelistic series, and we are working in the 1040 window. But you know what? People are being born faster than we're actually converting anyone. There's more people now than there were 100 years ago that are proportionately or more that have not heard the gospel. We think we're making progress. But apart from the Holy Spirit, this work is not going to be accomplished. We have nothing to celebrate about our accomplishments because they've been our accomplishments. God wants to do a deep work of cleansing. And that is why the very last message that Jesus speaks personally to his last day church is I counsel you. He wouldn't give us counsel if there was no hope. I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire. Faith working by love that you may be rich in white garments, which is the righteousness of Christ, that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve, the discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. Do we need this? Jesus says, personally, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. When we truly understand how much he loves us, then maybe we can let our guard down and we can actually start listening to his counsel. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What's the message to the Laodicean church ultimate conclusion? They're going to overcome. They're going to overcome by the blood of the lamb. 
I don't want to leave you discouraged. We are out of time. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is wanting to be poured out, is waiting to be poured out. In fact, is already beginning to be poured out. I believe we live in one of those times when we can be the final generation. It just takes a few of us to go back to our churches and ignite a fire that can explode rapidly around the world. This work could be completed in just a few short years. Very, very quickly. The suffering going on in Ukraine, the wars that are going on, the starvation in Africa, people's hearts failing them for fear literally all around the world can come to an end when God's people take to heart the message of repentance and reclaim the most precious message that will ignite a fire around the world. And I believe that is on our very doorsteps. We've shared this morning how for as long as I can remember, 1888, in one of Lloyd's less uh, optimistic comments, he said to me, yeah, being with this committee is like paddling your canoe upriver both ways. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But I believe those days are over. I believe that there are churches that are beginning to be revived. People are asking questions. They're going to want to hear from somebody who's been to an 1888 conference and find out what is that all about. Ministries are asking to partner with us. Media organizations are opening their doors. It's as if God doesn't want this held back any longer. And church leaders all the way to the general conference are now inviting us to meet with them and to discuss this with them. It is a new day in Adventism. God is on the move, and I want to be in step with him. And the only way that's going to happen is by experiencing repentance and inviting him into my life. And each one of us can do that. We've got a warehouse full of books that I think are going to get emptied out real quick. I want to thank you guys for supporting us by coming. I want to thank you for your generous donations this morning in our worship service. I want to thank you for your ongoing support. We have a very short time left on this world. And so be encouraged. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, you've heard the amens of your people. You have heard our recognition that things are not how they should be in your last day church. But this hasn't caught you by surprise because you actually prepared us for this with a message to the last church, the Laodicean church. Father, we want to confess that we recognize that this description of us as a people is true. It's true of our individual churches. It's true of our worship at home. It's true in our lives. We have all been Laodicean. And it makes you feel like throwing up. Father, as we realize our condition, may we feel like throwing up. May we accept the perfect robe of the righteousness of Christ that we have been studying about these last few days. It's free and offered to us through Christ. May we accept that faith that works by love. And Father, we want to see the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray that it can start with us but that we will be like Moses, the humblest of all people as we go back to your world church. And that we can put our arms around them in love so that they can see that we've been with you and that we don't condemn them. And we can just point them to you as the source of healing. 
We recognize that many will forsake us, but I pray that not one person here tonight in this room will be shaken out. Strengthen our faith, help our unbelief. Root out our unbelief, Father. Give us the faith of Jesus. May we believe your prophets. May we believe your son. And we do believe that Jesus wants to come back even more than we want him to come. Help us to burn with fire, our hearts with fire, recognizing that we have been with Jesus and we want to, to be back with him in a closer and deeper relationship every day. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our iniquities. And we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to stand for you as the last generation in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.